Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to First United Methodist. Light for the City, if you could stand and sing with me, we're going to sing This Is Amazing Grace. Father, your grace is amazing. We're here to lift your name up to our Father. We ask that you are here with us. We love you, dear Father. Amen.
God, giver of every good and perfect gift. We thank you for your faithful provision for our lives. Please accept these our tithes and offerings as a token of our humble gratitude and eternal love. May your will always be done here on earth, just as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasures you found. You can be seated. All bow as we go to God in prayer this morning. Oh God. We can come to the altar, a place where we can lay our burdens down, a place where we can receive strength for the day, a place where we can meet with you, and you come and meet with us. The whole world is your altar. So we do come today, Lord, continuing to lift up some people who are very much in need of prayer. Come today, Lord, praying for a friend of Bruce Barber's, Jeff Simminger. Jeff is uh, just 51 years old, suffering from bladder cancer. Also received a, an email from a pastor friend from here in Western Pennsylvania that had transferred down into Florida, and one of his parishioners, uh, Dave Carney, was over here in Hammond Hospital and visited with him. He had a heart cath this week. We pray, Lord, that his recovery will go well. We continue to lift up Dan Johnson as uh, he continues to heal from having his leg amputated, hoping to be fit with a prosthesis soon. Also saw Bill Masterson this week. He's uh, hoping to be able to get back into his house before too long. He's still over there at Twin Brooks. Also today, Lord, we pray for a couple of our regulars for Ed Tennant. Ed has uh, gallstones, has surgery scheduled for tomorrow. Also for Ron Colicchio, Ron fell out of bed, hit his head, over at Hammett, uh, probably heading over to Western Reserve for a little while. Also come today lifting up uh, a friend of Dave Miller and Bruce Barber's, uh, who had lived over here at uh, the Lodge on Sass. His name was Sean. Sean died. Oh, Lord, that we pray that that peace that passes all understanding will guard the hearts and minds of, they, of Sean's friends and family. Also come today, Lord, uh, praying for Pastor Malango from the Harvest Family Church. I was over visiting with him yesterday. His sister, Atoli, who lived in Iowa, died. She was just 58 years old. And we pray, Lord, you'll be with that family as well. And as we do each week, Lord, we pray for a few of the kids here in our own neighborhood. For, so for Kylie, Amora, and Lexi. Oh, Father, we're so thankful that we can come to your altar. That we can lift up to you the joys and concerns of our lives. That you hear us and you answer our prayers. All of this we pray in Jesus' name. I'm glad to have you all with us. Please take the friendship pads. They're either underneath the end chair on your row or in the center of your tables. If everybody would take those pads, please record your presence with us. If you happen to be with us for the very first time today, there's a card clipped in the front cover. You can take that, fill it out, and put it back in the card. Tell us a little bit about you. You'll also find a brochure clipped in the front cover. You're free to take one of those. It tells you a little bit about us. And we ask that everyone record their presence with us today. We have just a few announcements today. If we go from some weeks where we have so many announcements I can't track them all, well, this week we have actually have one of the fewest we've ever had, so I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, we did take uh, the Henderson Food Pantry people came over and, and picked up. Okay, I guess we're at Sunday supper first. All right. Sunday supper, we served 144 last, uh, last Sunday night over at First Presbyterian Church of the Covenant. That went very well. We're really thankful for all of those who helped out. Okay, now what are the, the bags of food? Okay, so they came over and picked up 33 bags and one box of food. They headed over to the Henderson Food Pantry. We're certainly thankful for all of you who donated that. Um, again, our annual church picnic is today. I don't know if this will be the best day. We're going to find out. It is supposed to stop raining between now and when we start. Um, again, we are meeting out at the pavilion by the Perry Monument out there on Presque Isle. Um, Loretta is going to be driving the bus out. So if you need a way out and a way back, it is possible. It'll be up to the Burkharts to make a decision on whether or not we do that or we cancel out there and, and go downstairs to Fellowship Hall. Uh, still a little early to make that choice. Um, so, yeah, so that uh, picnic's today. Um, also, next Sunday, 
we will again be gathering in worship with the people from the Harvest Family Church. What that means that's most important for you all to remember is this service will not meet at 9, th 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 at nine o'clock no. next week. We will have one service at 1030 over in the sanctuary. So it is a blended service with the people from this service doing part, the people from Arvis family doing part, the people from the sanctuary service doing parts. Um, we did this, we, we've done this one time impromptu that happened two years ago where suddenly the entire church showed up. That was really interesting. And then last year where we actually planned it, and uh, I talk, again talked with Pastor Malango yesterday, we're getting again uh, together again tomorrow. Uh, and only th okay, who was at the joint service last year? Some of you were. Okay, ask anybody who was there. It's neat, okay? God's doing some really interesting things here in Erie, but just remember, next week, don't come at 9 o'clock, come at 10.30, and we'll be over there. All right, we do have a few kids here today. Good morning. Harrison, where'd you go? Oh, there he is. He's flying like a bullet. Good morning, Olivia. Hello, Ava. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, Harrison, over here. How is everybody today? Good, good. Okay, if we look up on the screen, what we see is we see a little kid talking to an adult. Now, have you ever asked your mother for anything? Have you ever asked your mother for anything? Have you ever asked your mother for anything? Has anybody out there ever asked their mother for anything? Of course, we've all asked. Okay, so let's start, let's try this first one. What if we were to ask for a fish sandwich? I like fish sandwiches. You don't like fish. Do you like fish sandwiches? No. Okay, I like fish sandwiches. So I said, I said, okay. I asked my dad, Dad, can I have a fish sandwich? What would happen if my dad were to give me one of these? One more. What would happen if my dad were to give me a snake? Uh, is that a fish sandwich? Yeah. That's, by the way, that is the most venomous snake on the entire planet. I don't think my dad would ever give me that thing. Okay. All right. Let, let's try another one. All right. Try one more here. Okay, so you wouldn't give me that. Try one more. What if I asked for... Um, I like scrambled eggs. Scrambled eggs? Okay, those are actually hard boiled eggs. Okay? I like hard boiled eggs. So what if I did? Dad, can I have some hard boiled eggs? What if my dad gave me a scorpion? Scorpion? You a scorpion? Like, a, well, you could like cook a crab by a shell and then you could like. Okay, cook but I don't even think a scorpions are poisonous, so I'm not sure you want to mess with them. All right, so those are examples of, if you ask your dad for one thing, he's not going to give you something bad. All right, let's try one more. What if I ask for some more Orange Crush? You think my dad will give me more Orange Crush? Probably not. What's he going to give me? No, because I've had too much Orange Crush already today. All right, so it's not necessarily that, that your dad's going to give you everything you've ever asked for, but everything he's going to give you is going to be things that are good for you. All right, so this is from our Bible lesson today. We need all the busy people to help us read this out loud together. Let's read this. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So what's the gift that God gives to all of his children? The Holy Spirit. Okay, we do have some papers for everybody today. This is for Olivia. This is for Ava. You don't want one? You can take one for your brother. Okay. And this is for Harris. Let's pray. Gracious God, we're so thankful that every gift that you give us is a good gift. And then when we ask for things, you will always give us good things. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. You can sit down. So again, for at least the third week in a row, our Bible lesson is going to be from the Gospel of Luke. Uh, we've been carrying right on through here this uh, week. We're up to Luke chapter 11. I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 13. As usual, the words are up on the screen. And I invite you all to listen to God's word. He was praying in a certain place. And after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. 
he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive anyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. And then he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children are, in, are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever it is he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be open for you. For everyone who asks receives and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there any among you who, if your child asked for a fish, would give a snake instead of a fish? Or if a child asked for an egg, would give it a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is the word of God for the people of God. Let's pray. Lord God, Father of us all, we come to you today from hectic lives, learning, yearning to be near you in the stillness of this hour. Quiet our minds and provide rest for our souls as we listen to your word of life today. In the blessed name of Jesus, we pray. I want us all to listen to this very beautiful ancient Jewish prayer. Let's listen. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Belohe Abotenu, Elohe Abraham, Elohe Yitzchak, Belohe Yaakov, Ha'el Hagado, Hagibur Vehanora, El El Yon, Gomel Chasadim Tovim, Vekone Hako, Vezocher Chasde Abot. Umevim goel libne benehem, leman shmo baahava, melech ozer umashia umagain, baruch ata adonai magain Abraham. That is the opening blessing of a very ancient Jewish prayer. Their prayer is known as the Shamona Israel, which in English means the prayer of 18 blessings. To this day, very observant Jews will say that prayer three times a day, at morning, noon, and night. And it's that prayer that forms the very center of the liturgy in weekly Sabbath services at synagogues. The worshiper should always say that prayer while standing, and whenever possible, the worshiper is supposed to drape a talus or a prayer shawl over their head. It's even possible that Jesus himself said that prayer whenever he worshiped at the temple in Jerusalem. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, and the God of our fathers. Prayer is the most basic way that people seek God. Since the beginning of time, men and women have looked heavenward and have uttered words to God. They will utter words of praise. They will utter words of thanksgiving. They will utter words of petition. They have expressed their hopes and their fears, their joys and their sorrows, their compliments and their complaints to the one who they cannot see, but they believe is truly there. All people in all places and at all times have prayed to God. 
No place on earth is so remote or so backwards or so dark that people have not bowed their heads and stretched forth their hands and uttered words in prayer to God. Buddhists pray, Hindus pray, Jews pray, Christians pray, Muslims pray, tribal peoples pray. Yes, everybody prays. People of every kindred, nation, race, and tongue will utter words to God. Prayer appears to be virtually instinctive to us as human beings. A mysterious spark within all of us causes us to perceive of God's existence and our natural response is to utter words to God, the God who we sense is there. Now, we have a name for that mysterious spark, at least within Methodism. We call that spark provenient grace. Provenient grace precedes any human impulse or action. Before we can sense God, God reaches out and allows us to sense God's presence and gives us the ability to respond to what it is we sense. And the most natural response, the most basic instinct, is to utter words to God in prayer. We need you, Lord. We want you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Our Bible lesson today from Luke's Gospel contains one of the most frequently repeated passages in the entire Bible. We call it the Lord's Prayer. Now the Lord's Prayer is that ideal or model prayer that Jesus taught his original disciples back in the first century. It's a prayer that we continue to teach to Jesus and the disciples today here in the 21st century. For most Christians, the words of the Lord's Prayer roll off their tongues instinctively. Whose kingdom do we want to come? God's kingdom. And what do we pray for each and every day? Our daily bread. And if we want our sins to be, give, be forgiven, whose sins must we forgive? Uh, those who sin against us. And what don't we want anyone to lead us into? Into temptation. Most of us have said the words of the Lord's Prayer so many times that we know it inside out and backwards. In fact, when you know something that well, how do we put it? We say, you know it by heart. Those words of that prayer that Jesus <clears throat> taught us to pray, they have become a part of us. The Lord's Prayer is a universal prayer of all Christians. One of the humbling tasks of being a pastor is to visit with people in nursing homes. Now, I can remember one woman who I visited for a couple of years. Um, this is back when I was serving in my very first full-time church. And, and this woman, her ailments had reduced her to just a mere shell of a human being. She was a bedfast invalid. Her name was Carol. And she was totally dependent on other people to clothe her and to feed her and to bathe her. She led the most basic of existences. Uh, when, if she ever did attempt to speak, which was pretty rare, uh, she spoke so faintly um, that she scarcely made a sound. But I remember every time I would visit her, if I would begin to say the Lord's Prayer, she would start to mouth those words right along with me. I have to tell you, this is the kind of thing that could bring anybody to tears. Prayer is actually that fundamental. When you can do nothing else, you can still pray. Prayer really is the most basic way that people seek God. But we're not always sure how to pray. Is there a right way to pray? Is there a wrong way to pray? Are some prayers better than other prayers? Should we pray out loud? Or should we pray silently? Should we pray standing up? Or should we kneel in prayer? Should we pray standard prayers? Or should we make the words up as we go? There are just so many questions 
that we have about prayer. Well, we're not the only ones who have questions. Jesus' original disciples had questions too. So in our Bible lesson today, we have an unnamed disciple asking Jesus. This is in Luke 11 at the end of verse 1. Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray. Now, I think it would be wrong for us to assume that the disciples had no prior experience with praying. After all, all of Jesus' original disciples were devout Jews. The disciples all went to the synagogues at least weekly and perhaps even daily. So it is reasonable to assume that most of them probably went to Sabbath school uh, when they were young. And there the rabbis would have taught them, all of the disciples, about uh, the Jewish prayer customs. The rabbis would have taught the disciples that great Jewish prayer, the Shemona Ezrael, the prayer of 18 blessings. Now, I started this message today with a man reciting the first of those 18 blessings. Of course, he said it in Hebrew. The first blessing is the one that gives praise to our fathers. So the first blessing runs through a litany of the forefathers of the people of Israel, namely Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And boy, the prayer continues on with 19 blessings in all. Okay, now I'm sure you're wondering, why is a prayer that has 19 blessings called the prayer of 18 blessings? Well, uh, it had had 18 blessings for a really long time, around, long about 100 BC, they added a 19th blessing, but because the prayer had been called the prayer of 18 blessings for centuries, um, no one dared change the name. Now, you can smile at that kind of strangeness. We Christians have just as hard a time as updating our traditions as the Jews do with updating theirs. Anyway, the first three blessings of the Shemona Israel are blessings of praise. You know, praise of our fathers, praise of God's mighty deeds, praise of the holiness of God's name. The next 13 petitions, or the blessings are petitions. Now here the worshiper asks God for blessings like wisdom, and for healing, and for prosperity, and for the acceptance of their prayers. And then the Shemona Israel concludes with three final blessings of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for worship, thanksgiving for God, thanksgiving for that God is establishing peace. So the Shemona Israel is a very comprehensive prayer. So when that unnamed disciple asked Jesus to teach them how to pray, Jesus could have just started to recite the Shemona Israel, but he didn't. What Jesus does is he distills that great prayer to its very essence. Rather than having to say a mouthful like this, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, and the God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the great, the mighty, the revered God, the most high God, who bestows loving kindness, the creator of all. Jesus simplifies all of that simply saying, Father. Remember, the forefather of our forefathers is God, so simply saying Father is enough. And then Jesus shortens the third blessing to hallowed be your name. The word hallowed means to be consecrated, to be sacred, to be sanctified. Yes, God's name is holy. God's name is the name that's above all other names. Jesus has taken what took 101 Hebrew words in the Shemona Israel and has reduced it to what for us in English is Father, hallowed be your name. Jesus models a prayer not of many flowery words, but a prayer of a few pointed words. Today, we have books full of prayers for every day of the year and for every occasion. But we're still not always sure how to pray. 
So pray from the depths of your heart. Now, it really doesn't matter if your words are rehearsed and eloquent words. What matters is that whatever it is that you are saying or speaking, you're speaking from your heart. Now, the words, they might have originated with somebody else, but when you speak them, they must be your own words. It has to be you who is saying them. So rather than the words of the Lord's Prayer being just the words of Jesus, the words need to become your words. The Father isn't just Jesus' Father. He's your Father, too. It's not just Jesus who wants God's kingdom to come. You want it to come, too. Of course, Jesus doesn't have any sins to be forgiven, but we most assuredly do. Okay, most of you know, I've been a pastor about 16 years now. Okay, that means I've preached probably 800 messages so far. But I can still remember the very first time I preached. It was 16 and a half years ago. It was December 29, 2002. I was filling in for the pastor of the Bruss Valley Charge in the Indiana district. It was Michelle Wobrick, by the way. She had become the pastor over at Christ uh, here in Erie, and then she died, unfortunately, of cancer. But anyway, I was filling in for Michelle. So I actually got to preach my very first message three times. I preached it first at Mount Tabor, and then I preached it in Robinson, and finally I preached it at Calvary Church in Brush Valley. Now in a way, this was more like a triple nightmare. It really wasn't very good the first time, or the second time, or even the third time. Now, the short, the people were all very kind and they said very nice things, but I knew that the thing was lousy. Now, the problem was simple. Even though I had written the message myself, as I delivered the message, it came off just like words being from a page. I wasn't speaking the words as my words. Now, believe it or not, six months later, they invited me back and that time things went better. What I had learned was that the trick was to listen to myself as I preach. So it's simple. As I'm preaching to all of you, I'm preaching to me too. Now I'm not sure that that makes sense to, to all of you, but for me that represented a breakthrough. And of course, you know, the reality is I've, I've preached almost every Sunday since. Now, sure, I am very aware that some Sundays are a little better off than others, but every Sunday, I'm preaching right along to me as I'm preaching to you. That's what it needs to be like when you pray. If you're just reading the words from a page or reciting some words from memory, you're not really praying. But if you're earnestly listening to the words as you say them, uh, if you're letting those words flow from within you, if you've internalized those words, then you're praying. Now, I'm very much aware that there are many of you who are not all that comfortable with praying. But not only are you uncomfortable with praying in public, you're also uncomfortable praying in private. Now, the whole process of prayer and seem really weird to us. Now, now, sometimes you're afraid, you know, am I gonna say the right words? And besides, you know, it really is kind of hard to talk to someone who I can't see who is there. Now, I, I have no problem understanding why it is that people might want to avoid praying in public. After all, you really don't want to risk embarrassing yourself. But why should you avoid praying in private? Are you afraid of embarrassing yourself in front of God? You know, think about this. God already knows absolutely everything about you, knows you even better than you know yourself. So in God's eyes, um, you can never be a fool as long as you're actually being you. Prayer is putting your thought into words. Your thoughts about God, your thoughts about life, your thoughts about your family and your friends your thoughts about our world. Praise God for what God means to you. Ask God for the things that matter to you. 
and thank God for the many things in your life. So yes, when you pray, always pray from the depths of your heart. And remember that God's Spirit is always interceding for you. Now, you might mess up in prayer, but the Holy Spirit never messes up in prayer. Now, it's very comforting to know that the Holy Spirit constantly brings your hopes and your fears, your joys and your concerns before God's throne. One of the most comforting verses in all of the Bible is one that's in Paul's letter to the Romans. This is Romans 8.26. Paul writes, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. When we don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit always does. That kind of pain that's too deep for words, the Holy Spirit expresses in groans for us. The kind of pain associated with the loss of a loved one, or the kind of pain from enduring abuse, or the kind of pain that comes from being betrayed by someone close to you. The Holy Spirit communes with your spirit in such pain. When people remember what Jesus taught us about praying, I don't think that they, that they remember the parables that Jesus used in Luke's Gospel to illustrate what it is that he was saying. First, Jesus tells of a man who goes to a friend's house in the middle of the night asking for three loaves of bread to feed a, a visitor who has arrived late at night. Now, the friend doesn't give him the bread because he is his friend, but because he made a pest of himself in the middle of the night. Now, if that story had to stand all on its own, you might think that Jesus is telling us to be persistent in our prayers. Uh, if we want to get what we want to get from God, we need to make a really big pain out of ourselves. But Jesus never wanted that story to stand all by itself. So rather, after the story, Jesus goes on to make a very plain statement. This is Luke 11, 9. Jesus says, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened unto you. Jesus is saying that God isn't like that friend who begrudgingly gives you bread in the middle of the night. No, God gives you bread simply because you ask for bread. God isn't trying to make this hard. Then Jesus concludes with an analogy. If earthly parents want to give their children good gifts, God wants to give his children good gifts too. Now, if a son asks his father for his fish, would the father give him a snake? Or if the son asked the father for an egg, would the father give him a scorpion? No way, earthly parents don't do that to their children whom they love. So God gives us a gift that is better than anything any earthly parent could give us. The Holy Spirit dwelling with us. And as the Holy Spirit works in each of our lives, we can receive God's spiritual fruits. Those are the fruits of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. God hasn't left us alone. God has given us God's Spirit. So when we sing, God's Spirit sings with us. And when we laugh, God's Spirit laughs with us. But in the same way, when we cry, God's Spirit cries with us. And when we moan, God's Spirit moans with us. That's how in tune God's Spirit is with the lives of those who love God. No matter how low you get, no matter how dark it seems, God's Spirit never leaves you or forsakes you. And remember that God's Spirit really is always interceding for you.
The great Jewish prayer of 18 blessings begins with, Blessed are you, O Lord our God and the God of our fathers. Yes, prayer is the most basic way people seek God. When we can do nothing else, we can still pray. We can utter words to God. But we're not always sure how to pray. Must all prayers have praise, petition, and thanksgiving? Yet Jesus' model prayer is simple and to the point. So pray from the depths of your heart. Mean what you say and say what you mean. Internalize your words. And remember that God's Spirit really is always interceding for you. When you don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit does. Praying is uttering words to God. But not just any words. Words spoken from your heart. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for listening to our prayers, for receiving our praise, for answering our petitions, and for rejoicing with us in our thankfulness. May the words of our mouths and the thoughts of our hearts always be pleasing in your sight.
You. 